A Billion Suns is the latest game in the Osprey Blue Book series, bearing the subtitle Interstellar Fleet Battles. It's jumping into this galaxy through the power of its 64 pages of softback full colour goodness, and it's the new creation from Mike Hutchinson, whose first game, Gaslands, turned into a bit of a wargaming behemoth after its initial release. The introduction to this book, Mike's new, sophomore effort, begins on page 4, with a piece of flavour text that makes the setting of A Billion Suns extremely clear. It's a far-flung future of space exploration, where battling corporations try to stamp their ownership on distant and financially viable space systems. That's a future we'd say is quite a pessimistic one. If it wasn't for the fact that present day's least favourite mad scientist type billionaire is currently setting up the spacefaring wing of his evil empire. Maybe it's a horribly feasible future. Anyway, the timeline that comes after the intro text takes us from 1969's moon landing all the way to the far future of 3120, where close to a billion stars have been registered and claimed by the corporations. After some more narrative MacGuffins, and good ones they are too, are covered, we get into the game itself. Mike's opted to start things out with a pre-rules tutorial. This basic training starts on page 6, and in just two pages, it gives a really good impression of what the game's about. You'll get playing and learning instantly, without feeling confused or overwhelmed, so that's a great start. As with the other Osprey books we've looked at lately, there are pages of feature art between some of the sections, in the shape of fancy space vessels in this one. These add some visual grandeur to a book that's otherwise pretty functional and perhaps even a tad sparse in places. What you need to play goes through, well, the things you need to play. Some pertinent details, and we'll get into some of these later on, are that games play over multiple boards at once, and the rules have been designed to work with whatever models you might have in your collection. You'll need a variety of dice too, D6s, D8s, D10s and D12s. Playing cards are used to represent contracts, which are the missions, and there are various tokens included in the book, but also downloadable from the Osprey Games website if you want to keep the pages of the book pristine. Spaceships are covered next. They're referred to as ships, even when multiple smaller craft may be the ship in question, a bomber wing for example. And these have a position, the model's centre point, and a heading which is where it's facing. With these simple basics, the game can fit in any kind of spacefaring model. Ships get formed into battle groups, consisting of the same class of ships, and these are activated together. A chart on page 11 lists all the classes, and this is wide enough range to encompass any kind of vessel you might want to bring into the battlefield, be it a 40k Battlefleet Gothic Biggie, an X-Wing fighter, a strange gribbly alien biomass, or whatever else you might feel like putting through its paces. The important factor, at least from a supply perspective, is the cost of each class, from 1 for a recon wing, all the way to 40 for a battleship. The more you spend, the more you get in your ships, which consist of different elements in their profiles. Mass is the bulk of the ship, and impacts various rules. Thrust is how many inches it can move in one ahead action. Silhouette re uh, reflects not just the physical, but also the energy signature size of the vessel. Shields are the protective element that your battle group has, and the weapons, well, they make pew pew noises and they cause other ships to go kaboom. Um, unless you prefer realistic sci-fi, where of course, in space no one can hear you scream, let alone distinguish the sound of beam weapons clashing and causing untold destruction on starships. Page 12 brings us to the core concepts, and it starts with dice details. Low rolls are good in this game, and the highest possible roll will always count as a dud, even if there's modifiers applied. Measuring's done from the centre point of ships, pre-measuring can be done as much as you want at any time, and, offering some tactical flex in the game, when you're measuring the distance to and from ships uh, that make up your battle group, you can use the centre point of any of the ships in that battle group, so that's kind of interesting. There are other things covered, but that's getting a bit too granular for this overview, Suffice it to say, uh, it's a thorough offering and reinforced by box outs down the side of the pages at times which highlight key concepts, offer info or give suggestions. We can't skip over the basics of scale and credits though, as they are a core element of gameplay. The larger the scale, the larger a game will be, 
and the more credits the players, or CEOs as they are called, will have to purchase their forces. And this is where we need to take a little aside briefly, because this is one of the most fascinating elements of the game. You don't choose a full force pre-game. Each turn, CEOs buy up the ships they need and jump them into battle. This spend will decrease your overall number of credits and may even put you into a deficit. But, as all good CEOs know, you've got to speculate to accumulate and by focusing your spend in the right areas at the right time, you'll have a much better chance of securing objectives that will then boost back your final credit. So there's a lot of risk and reward here. But now we'll get back to the book and to page 15, playing the game. Starting a game is really simple. CEOs randomly generate th three contracts, which are the objectives. They agree on the scale of the game and then they get things set up. Gameplay itself consists of multiple rounds and each round contains a command phase, a jump phase, a tactical phase and an end phase. As with many games, it's easier to play and learn the rules by doing that than it is to listen to some random on the internet try and describe them all. So we're going to do our best to keep things here pretty simple. But there's a lot of really good stuff in this game and we don't want to miss out the cool things. So the command phase. This involves assigning tokens to slots on your helm card. Kind of imagine you're some evil corporate overlord sitting in your big leather chair that costs more than most folks make in a lifetime and you're directing the vessels from afar. You do this by assigning command tokens and the number of tokens available is the game scale plus three. So for your first game at the suggested scale of three, that's six command in total. These command total um, tokens are essentially an alternative credit system that you must also balance as you play. Spend them to boost what you can in the different phases, so you'll need to strategize really carefully with them. If you put the tokens in the seize initiative part of your helm, you can spend them to roll with lower dice when determining who will have the initiative in the next phase. If you put them in the jump in part of the helm, you'll have more resources, so you'll be able to bring more ships to the various play areas. Tokens in the tactical helm will let you give more command options to these ships. A Billion Sons is a game about juggling chainsaws and balancing plates all at the same time and without pushing too far to make yourself look like a gameplay jester. Once into the jump phase, players spend their assigned command tokens to requisition and deploy jump points, which are the spots where your ships can join the board, or to deploy battle groups at those jump points. These battle groups are not predetermined, they're chosen at deployment from all the available ships, which makes for incredibly flexible options and a truly dynamic game. There are neat mechanics all over the place, too many for us to cover here, but even stuff like jumping has its own quirks. Battle groups deploy within 6 minus M inches of a jump point, with M being the mass of your battle group. What that means is Titanic vessels will appear really close to the jump point, but a swarm of ships, like a fighter wing, with a mass of zero, can deploy with far more versatility and distance. The tactical phase is where you'll do your manoeuvring and fighting, and it's covered through a good bit of the rest of the book. Before we get into that though, how does the game end? Well, once two contracts are exhausted at the end of a round, which means that no more credits can be made from them, that's it, the game ends. Victory is determined by which player has a combination of the most positive credits left over from requisitioning battle groups and the highest credits total, which are earned in game. But back to the activations, which happen on a per battle group basis. CEOs issue an order, which is either vector, engage, red alert, or jump out. Vector allows an extra move action. Engage allows a battle group to choose a target and re-roll attack dice against it. Red Alert helps the battle group recover by removing damage, and Jump Out lets them flee without counting as destroyed, if they're close enough to a jump point. These things all act as bonuses in the normal activation sequence, and they're more layers of modifiers that are easy to apply, but bring extra decision making pr to proceedings, and really extra diversity to the game. Pages 20 to 21 cover movement. It's what you probably expect, ships pivot and thrust, and if they pivot more than 90 degrees, the G's will stop it attacking with its primary weapon. After that, passive attacks kick in. 
These are akin to Overwatch. Any passive ships that now have the active one within range and arc of their auxiliary weapons may attack it. This adds further consideration to move actions. It not only brings a risk to the moving battle group, but it rewards astute placement and facing after moves by setting up uh, your ships to cover areas ahead of your opposing CEO's movement. Jump out is as it sounds, a chance to get a battle group off the battlefield safely. Due to the budgeting element of the game, this isn't actually as odd a choice as it may sound. With all that done, it's the active attacks phase, and this is where the active battle group gets its chance to fire. But before that, the book details the final scan step, which may be needed to fulfill a contract or cover a special rule. Anyway, on with combat, which is described on page 24 and starts with a weapon systems table. This covers a lot from light blasters to full on planet smashers. The game's got you covered. Each weapon has a range with both a minimum and maximum amount that targets must be within. There's a number of attack dice, which ranges from 1d6 all the way up to 4d12, and these are used to determine the number of hits. And then there's a damage value listed, which shows the amount of damage that each of those unsaved hits will place on the target. You have primary and auxiliary weapon systems. All primary weapon systems have a 45 degree arc of fire to the front of the ship. Auxiliary weapon systems have a 180 degree arc of fire, again to the front of the ship. These weapons can target a primary target and then multiple auxiliary targets. Once you've decided on those, the attacking CEO rolls the weapon's dice. Any result on those dice that is equal to or under the target silhouette is a success. Ones count as critical hits and they'll cause a bonus hit. If the target has a shield's value, it may make save throws and it must roll equal to or under its shield value. After that, unsaved hits add up all their total damage values and apply them to the target. And that's it for the basic rules. And we've already done a hefty amount of flip through it already. So, much as we want to go all the way with this, we're going to have to leave it here for you to digest and we'll come back with part two next week, getting into the game's other elements. That's a load of additional rules, details on space, where your battles will be for and the objects that are in it, the contracts, the missions, how revenue works, and much more. Before we go though, if you haven't already guessed, we're pretty keen on this game, and we already, even though we're halfway through the book, can fully recommend A Billion Sons as a great new gaming addition to your collection. This video has been brought to you by WI Prime, Wargames Illustrated Magazine's online members club. View more videos or find out more about WI Prime by following these links.